that you once had a tail. No, I'm not talking about some ancestor millions of years ago. I'm talking about you. The human tail peaks in length at around five weeks of gestation, and then it begins to shrink. Slowly, over the next couple of weeks, your tail is reabsorbed back into your body, and by the time you are seven weeks old, you no longer have a tail. You have a tailbone that's retained into adulthood. But why? Why do human embryos have tails, and why do we have tail bones? Well, Charles Darwin believed that these structures are vestiges of our evolutionary past. Some parts which are rudimental in man, as the Oscocix, reveal the descent of man from some lower form in an unmistakable manner. The Oscocix in man, though functionless as a tail, plainly represents this part in other vertebrate animals. At an early embryonic period it is free, and as we have seen, projects beyond the lower extremities. Charles Darwin and contemporary evolutionists classify the tailbone as a vestigial organ. This means that it's the remnant of a structure that we inherited from our ancestors, and now it's lost a significant function. But are they right? Is our tailbone actually kind of the evolutionary leftovers from our ancient monkey ancestors millions of years ago? Well, to answer that question, we need to take a detailed look at the development of the human embryonic tail. Human gestation is classified into various periods called Carnegie stages, and your tail begins to develop around Carnegie stage 13, which corresponds to week 4. And at that time, you are the size of a grain of rice. Tiny! The, the distance from the tip of your head to your rear is 6 millimeters, so you are quite literally as long as a single grain of rice. And that's when your tail begins to start growing and protruding out of your body. Your tail peaks in length around Carnegie stage 16. That corresponds to about week 5, week 6 of development. And at that point, you've grown a bit. Your body is now 11 millimeters in length, which corresponds to about the width of a USB port. At this point, you have up to 16 pairs of caudal somites. And these are like the little precursors to your vertebrae. Eventually, they turn into the vertebrae, forming the sacrum and the coccyx, or the tailbone. But to form the normal sacrum and coccyx, you only need about 10 somites overall. And you have 16 at this point, so you have extra precursors that never actually turn into vertebrae. Having reached its glorious peak, the human tail suddenly begins to wither away. At that point, your body is basically the width of your standard lighter, about 23 millimeters across, and your tail is no more. So why would we start growing a tail just to break it down a few weeks later? Well, evolutionists believe that the tail is this evolutionary vestige. So they think that we inherited the genes for tail formation from our primate ancestors. And so in development, we still begin to develop a tail, but since having a tail as an adult is not selectively advantageous, it doesn't help us pass on our genes more, we just kind of stop tail formation and degrade it. However, the human embryonic tail actually plays an often overlooked role in human development. So let's talk about that, but first we need to review general spinal anatomy. So first of all, your brain and your spinal cord are both part of your central nervous system. They form one continuous structure. There's no clear break between your brain and your spinal column. It's all kind of one thing. It's continuous. And your spinal column travels down your back, surrounded by vertebrae. Now, right about at the level of your upper lumbar vertebrae, your spinal column comes to an end. 
the spinal cord terminates in a structure called the conus medullaris. And from there, individual nerves travel downwards. It looks like a bunch of hairs all of a sudden split away from each other and kind of form this hairy mass, which is why it's called the cauda equina. It's said to look kind of like a horse tail. So back to development. Your tail is originally quite complex. It has a lot of different things in it. You've got those somites or the precursors to the vertebrae. You've got layers of mesenchyme, a tail gut, uh, a secondary neural tube, lots of different things going on in your tail. I want to focus on the secondary neural tube. Now this is basically the precursor to some neural tissue, so nerves down at the end of your spinal cord. And this material originally forms as kind of little bubbles or vesicles suddenly appear uh, coalescing inside of the tail and form this long tubular structure that's called the secondary neural tube. Now, the cells in this tube originally begin to differentiate, which means they change how they look a little bit and begin to act a little different so that they can play a certain role in the body. But then, when your tail begins to be reabsorbed back into your body, those cells in the secondary neural tube de-differentiate themselves. So they almost go back in time to what they were before they had become specialized. They go back and become a more kind of generic type of cell. And then they differentiate again. The tissue in that neural tube ends up forming two different structures. The uppermost portions of it create the conus medullaris, remember the end of that spinal cord, and then the bottom portion of it creates the filum terminale. The filum terminale is a stretchy structure and it acts like a ligament, but it contains neural tissue. And what it's doing is it's basically anchoring the spinal cord in place. So, let me give you a demonstration here. When you arch your back, or straighten your back, or kind of extend your spine in any way, you're basically pulling your spinal cord up. And the problem with that is that your spinal cord can't just be pulled up forever then. It, it does need to come back down into its resting position. And the filum terminale sits down at the bottom. It's connecting the bottom of your spinal cord to your tailbone. And it basically is stretchy, allowing you to extend your spinal cord and stretch the ligament, pulling the spinal cord out. And then, because it's stretchy, when you return your back to a normal position, it pulls the spinal column back down into its resting position. But at this point in development, the precursors to both of those structures are down inside your tail. And what happens is that they begin to migrate upwards as your tail begins to degrade. Apoptosis or controlled cell death begins to occur as the tail retreats. And in the second trimester, a curious thing happens. Your vertebrae actually begin to grow at a faster rate than your spinal cord. So all of a sudden, your vertebrae are getting tall and your spinal cord isn't really growing as much. And this has the effect of basically pulling your entire spinal cord up relative to your vertebrae, which means that all of these structures are pulled up. The conus medullaris, the tip of the spinal cord, is finally pulled up into position and the filum terminale is pulled up into position as well. So to summarize all of those sciency words, your tail plays an important role in your development. It forms the tip of your spinal cord and another structure that holds your spinal cord in place. And originally, the precursors to both of these structures form in your tail, and then they get pulled up into your body. So the embryonic tail does some significant stuff. All right. What about our tailbone? As adults, we still have a tailbone. Why do we need this guy? Well, the tailbone or coccyx is formed of several small fused vertebrae. When you look at the surface, you can see there are little lines running across it. Those are the edges of each of the vertebrae. In this case, four different pieces have grown fused together to become one coccyx. You can have usually between three and five segments. And your tailbone is quite small, usually just about three centimeters in height. It 
curves forward just a little bit, and it sits hanging off the bottom of your sacrum. This guy is what uh, your, your pelvic bones, your hip bones connect to. And right underneath it, hanging off the bottom, is your coccyx. Now, there's a bunch of different significant structures that attach to the coccyx. One of those is the phylum terminale that we already talked about. So that stretchy ligament on the back of the spinal cord actually runs down your back, connects to your tailbone. So that serves as the anchor for that ligament. But there's other ligaments as well, some of which connect the tailbone to the sacrum, and others of which connect the tailbone to the anus. The anocoxygeal ligament stretches between your coccyx and the anus, and it stabilizes and secures the anus in its position. In addition, the ischiocoxygeus, levator ani, and gluteus maximus muscles all attach to your coccyx. The ischiocoxygeus is one of several muscles that forms up the pelvic floor, so it's kind of like this web or net that kind of holds up the internal organs down there. So it supports things like the bladder, the prostate, and the vagina. The three muscles in the levator ani muscle group also form part of the pelvic floor. They support the sexual organs and they perform some of those functions of those sex organs, as well as playing a role when you urinate and when you defecate. Finally, the gluteus maximus, or big butt muscle, has a minor attachment on the coccyx. Uh, the gluteus maximus serves to extend your leg or kind of pull it backwards. So like the embryonic tail, the human tailbone is not useless. It has some important uses. You're going to be having a lot of problems down there if your muscles and ligaments don't attach to your tailbone properly. Whether you're trying to pee or poop or have sex, all of those things are dependent on this little bone because those muscles attach to this bone. At this point, the evolutionists in the comments section are probably typing away furiously on their keyboards. And they're probably making the point that vestigial organs don't need to be useless. An organ can have a function and still be considered vestigial. And that is correct. According to kind of the evolutionary conception of vestigial organs, they simply have reduced function when compared to the ancestral state. So to put that in common words, they believe that the monkey once had a tail, right? And the structures that formed the monkey's tail basically over time evolved into my tail bone. And that it lost some of the functions. It doesn't do the same things that it once did when my ancestor had a tail. So this allows them to say that a structure can be vestigial even if it's still very fundamental or plays very important roles. The problem is that this is not particularly convincing as a creationist. Vestigial organs really appeal to people who already believe in evolution because it affirms their preconception. But for me as a creationist, I look at these structures and both the embryonic tail and the tail bone play significant roles in the human body. And so without that presupposition of common ancestry, there's no reason for me to believe that these structures are evolutionary vestiges from my primate ancestors. Instead, I view them as beautifully designed structures that God created and placed into the human body to perform their specific roles.